Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, a podcast by Filecoin Foundation that explores the intersection of blockchain and the data economy. I'm your host, Aaron Stanley, and today I'm joined by Bill Schreckenstein, who's been a key player in the Filecoin world for several years now as an engineer, solutions architect, and an overall distributed storage gigabrain, a, a, a coin I'm terming here today. So, Shrek, thanks for coming on the show. Aaron, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here today. So I'd love for you to introduce yourself to start off with. And so you actually started your career building weapon systems with Lockheed Martin. So I was hoping you could tell us a bit about that. That's a pretty interesting background. Uh, and then talk a bit about how you ultimately like found your way into Filecoin decentralized storage. Uh, that's that's a great start, actually. So uh, back in 2000, after I graduated from Syracuse University, you can see my uh, banner back there. But um, <laughs> I ended up working at Lockheed Martin uh, MS2 Systems in Liverpool, New York, and and started working on naval weapon systems. And we had a program called the SQQ89, and it was really my my first real job out of school, right? My first big boy job, and. Uh, we were working on essentially core components that, that manage the system. We called it common system services. And from there, I, I got involved with several other projects, uh, mobile radar for the U.S. Army. Um, and my last gig, uh, I transferred to Marietta, Georgia and started working on flight simulators, which was a really, really cool uh, application. But what it did was it set me up for this longer term run in my career. And near the end of my time at, at Lockheed Marietta, um, I was building a storage platform for, for high performance recording for flight sim. And some of what you see in the movies, right, when they when they talk about what it's like to be in the military, some of it's not true. Some of it is. And one of the cool things, and I, I, I've pointed this out to people before, is there's a scene in Top Gun, a movie everybody knows, everybody loves. And they're, they're essentially replaying the simulation and saying, you took this angle, you use this weapon, this is what you should have done. Well, we were recording simulations for, for exercises like that. The true value wasn't the actual recording. The true value was the knowledge obtained from the recording. So you would have pilots flying mm -hmm. against each other and, and going through this, this process to say, hey, you know, you should have used guns here. You should have taken this angle. You should have made this move. And they would debrief the pilots in real time. And it was really awesome to see, right? You're building something that's so practical and so useful. And it got me into storage. And at that point, um, a VAR that I was uh, working with at the time, uh, you know, they were our, we were a vendor, they were our vendor. He said, hey, you know, we really like your work. Would you come work for us? And I said, sure. So I started going out into the world and building storage platforms. Um, I did a InfiniBand fabric for Sandia National Labs, started doing all these really cool compute storage projects. And while I was doing it, I encountered a gentleman that you know quite well, uh, Stefan Vervat. And he hired me as a, as a field engineer, solutions architect, sales engineer at, at a company called Ample Data. It was a startup. And I was brought in to essentially run federal and the Southeast Territory. We were then acquired by HGST Western Digital. Um, and of course, you know, you're staying in storage and you're still doing a lot of the same things, solution architecture, sales. I still had a massive territory to manage and it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and at that point, the writing was kind of on the wall at, at WD, in, in my opinion, in terms of what direction they wanted to go in. And it didn't really align with, with my career expectations. So I moved on to a company that did on-prem S3 storage. It was a company called Cloudian and they're still alive and kicking today. They're still out doing their thing. But it was it was really fun to go and meet with customers of so many different types. Um, we did genomics installs, media and entertainment installs, and and really honed in. I honed in further even more on, on storage at that point because really data is so valuable. And and that's kind of dovetailed into the some of the projects that I'm working on today. But at that point, I reunited with Stefani, said, hey, you know, come on over, join us on the foundation. As a matter of fact, it was May of, of 2021. He said, Shrek, I'm, I'm taking this job at Protocol Labs. It's really interesting. And if I really like it, I want you to come over and, and, and work with me, help me out. And I said, you know, cool. So uh, later on that year, I, I, I joined the Filecoin Foundation um, and started working there for some time. And we were working on different solutions. One of the, the challenges that we had, and I'm sure you're, you're kind of familiar with this, right, is, is getting data onto the network. The network itself serves a significant purpose, but the on-ramps weren't easy. And at that point, um, 
I was talking with a few folks. They said, hey, why don't you go over and, and elevate yourself into PL and, and take on technical leadership and, and start building some of these solutions. And obviously, you know, you kind of know what, how PL has gone since then. But at that point, we were we were looking at building out data on ramps uh, to really make DSNs practical for, for the common user. As a layman, when you walked into the into the Filecoin network, it was hard to navigate. Um, part of my role when I first joined the foundation as an architect was to help them navigate that path. But everything was so new and so fresh, we were kind of figuring things out as we went. And so it created a lot of challenges. And um, at that point, we've all since nucleated out of PL. Um, I'm working as a consultant on one blockchain project, which is pretty wild, and uh, still kind of building our stealth startup in the background. As a matter of fact, we're about to enter pre-seed on our own token uh, it, this week. So it's a really exciting time for us. Um, we expect pre-seed to last about 30 days. Then we're jumping into a seed round. And we've been silently building some of the components of our product um, independently. We're not getting paid, of course. But we're doing this, as, as I like to tell people, on our own time, on our own dime. Um, <laughs> You, you sometimes have to do these things, you know, to, to build a business. It takes a lot of work. We've we've had our, our I don't want to say setbacks or more like resets. One of the things that you, you get into with the crypto spaces is, is and you, you speak about this a lot, right? Regulation, regulation, regulation. How is your foundation structured? Right. What do you what are your concerns about things like the SEC token utility, your token economics? And we've been slowly iterating over this. We have a really powerful team assembled. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons I'm so excited is, is the team we've put together. We have multiple business partners already in our ecosystem. We haven't even launched the token yet. We have a few business partners, a chief of staff, full legal representation. We have the means to take accredited investment. So we're really kind of taking this thing very, very seriously. And we've got a full head on charge as we, we roar into 2025. And we feel that we're timing the launch of the token in a very appropriate sense, because as you saw last night, as we rolled through this election, what happened with Bitcoin, man, it shot over 75. So we, we feel like we're timing this thing very, very well. And we're really excited to, to kind of take the bull by the horns and, and build this product. So I know you're still in stealth, so you can't you know disclose too much about what you're doing. But maybe could you give us like a um, you know a sneak preview of of like I mean, I'm assuming this is, this is still in sort of the data you know blockchain based data services world, right? Tangential to Filecoin. Um, anything you can disclose at this stage about like what Absolutely. you guys are? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I have no problem going into detail. Oh, uh, right. The reason being is yes, we're in stealth, but we've talked to so many people about it. And I don't feel like we're in stealth anymore. We yeah, are like not much, worst, not much of a secret anymore. Huh? <laughs> we're like the worst stealth craft ever, right? We're seen by every radar now. It's it's kind of wild, <laughs> but, but in theory, we see data as an asset. And one of the things that was cool, you were there, Filecoin Uncharted, right? We got to hear from Michael Casey and Michael Clark about data is an asset and why it's so important and and why data is is essentially people call it the new oil there, there's so many euphemisms around data right and essentially what we're building is is what we call the bridge it's literally an orchestration layer we can provide uh, warm cache storage and, and do a few other things like that as a matter of fact we're working on some advanced CDN concepts that will work out of this orchestration framework which are pretty wild but ultimately we're building an orchestration layer, and think of us as you do banking, right? You 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 will send money from one country to another. There's a network called SWIFT. We are essentially going to be the SWIFT network for data. We mm -hmm. will support multiple DSNs, but the other thing that we're doing, and and this is where I feel a lot of people get kind of ahead of themselves. They they abandon Web two constructs. We are not doing that. We will support Web two targets. That includes S three, on prem NAS, on prem SAN, DSN. And obviously DAS. So these things are important. And the reason being is that one of the things that I learned as a sales engineer when we were selling S3 solutions was that we would walk in and, and start talking about really what the product does and, and why it's so different. And S3 was a hard sell because people would look at it and say, oh, I need the storage API. I don't have a folder. I can just drag and drop my data and everything's copacetic. It, that's not how it worked, right? And, and out of that spawned these transient gateways to allow people to say, oh, I've got NFS in front of S3 and I can move the data. Those things were necessary because what you were doing was disrupting their entire workflow. And what happened was once they started adopting S3 storage, they started seeing the value of the protocol. Mm. And the protocol in S3 is everything. People don't understand what you can really do with S3 and how powerful it really is. 
And that adoption takes time. But if you can support all of their legacy data motions and translate that into what you're building in the background, what you're doing is creating that on-ramp for the data. And then later you can you can decouple and say, okay, now I'm just going to support S3. I don't need NFS. I don't need SIFs. I don't need any of this anymore. And it becomes a natural and smooth transition. So for us, uh, the goal is really to build that on-ramp for all of these different platform types. The other thing that happens is sometimes people will create a new protocol. I mean, essentially DSNs are a whole new protocol, a whole new way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So if you have a framework that is pre-built, I can plug in anything as it comes along. So if someone comes along and says, hey, I've invented the greatest new storage protocol of all time, you're going to face customer resistance. They're going to say, yeah, but I got to change my workflow. It's a software impact. And it's like, but if I have a framework that allows me to move it from those legacy protocols into this new one, it helps smooth the adoption. And, and this is where DSNs have met a lot of resistance. It's an entirely new paradigm of thought. And when you say DSN, you're sort of like decentralized storage networks. Yes. Right? Well, Sorry, yeah. I should clarify for, for those of you at home. I do mean when I say <laughs> DSN, decentralized storage network. Right. Uh, okay. it, it, it's very, it, it's a, an amazing concept. So you have the file coins of the world that have really introduced a whole new paradigm to storage. And, and people haven't quite grasped yet why it's so relevant. And that will take time. But if you can deliver a high quality service in front of Filecoin and get that data onto Filecoin and let people organically see that value and see what it can do for you, it, it smooths adoption. There's an emotional resistance to change. We, we as people are, are naturally inclined to emotionally resist things. I, I worked with a colleague, uh, his name was Chris Pettit back when I was at Lockheed, and he had the concept of reduction to the familiar. It was one of the favorite mm. things I ever took from that job. And, and the reason being is that when you and I are having a conversation about something that I understand but you don't, I have to explain it to you in terms that you're familiar with in order for you to, to adopt that principle. Right. So DSNs are a whole new frame of thought. So if I can translate that into a way where people are comfortable, it smooths that adoption. It removes emotional resistance. Right, right, and that's this is a theme we've we've talked about quite a bit on this show, actually, including with, with Stefan, uh, and just even going back like twenty years, you know, the concept of cloud storage was met with a similar kind of resistance, right? Where mm -hmm. people were like, wait a minute, I mean, I'm going to take my data that's in my you know mainframe in my closet here and put it like in the cloud, some random place. That's a crazy idea, right? Like, right, and that I mean, twenty years later, it's like, yeah, like that's just what everybody does, right? But like twenty years ago, that was that was that was, was, that was absurd, right? So, it, it, I mean, I mean, I would love to hear a bit more about your, like your 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 perspective on how how these types of changes, uh, um, you know, or how this type of mindset shift can really can really happen, particularly in the world of you know, like enterprise. I mean, this is this is a very conservative line of business, right? Like, like sure. enterprise story. Like these are not like high risk on you know companies or entities that are that are are are, are they're not just looking for like new flashy things for these types of services, right? They're just looking for like. Like I want something that's, that's going to work and it's not going to get me fired you know, if something goes wrong, right? But like, yeah. how, how do you see like these, these types of like paradigm shifts ultimately like playing out? It, so it, it, very similar to what you saw with the S3 revolution. When, when S3 came into existence, you had companies like Avere, Nasuni. What they did was they took all of the legacy storage protocols. That's how you ingested the data. And then they wrote it out S3 out the back. And, and that's one of the reasons we're building the bridge, because ultimately a lot of people aren't ready to adopt. F making a deal on Filecoin is not something that's instant. It's not easy. But if you can automate and smooth that process and all they have to do is write a file, just like they would to an S3 target, to them, they're, they're blind. They, they, they don't care. It just works. And that's ultimately how you're going to, to cater to that adoption. There's also things that you will need for, for certain DSNs, Filecoin included, that aren't there natively today, encryption being one of those things, right? And even to a degree, whether it's, you know, whether you call it EC, sharding, whatever, some of these things also need to be done. You can do that on the front end, move it to the back, and it smooths things out. So from that perspective, in, in order to, to get people to embrace the technology for what it is, you, you need that transient method, that, that way to slowly ease them into it. And what happens is they end up seeing the value of the protocol, things like native immutability, the geographic distribution, all those things start to become relevant. They say, hey, this is, this is really cool tech. I'm, I'm ready to take the next step. How do I interact directly and take out the middleman? And that is exactly what happened with S3. Interesting. Yeah, and it feels like the timing for, for, for DSNs and, and just this concept of decentralized storage and this idea of really 
um, kind of locking in this notion that like data has value, like you were mentioning before, is really sort of hitting a kind of a zeitgeist moment right now. I mean, I think with with the emergence of these AI models and like a lot of people mm-hmm. starting to think a little bit more carefully about like, okay, do we really want all this stuff kind of centralized with these mega, you know, large companies, et cetera. Right. And I think people are starting to ask a few more, maybe more questions than maybe they were before about like, is this the right way to, you know, is there a better way to maybe, maybe, you know, action this, some of these concepts, right? So I would love for you to maybe talk a bit about like, like are we in a zeitgeist moment right now where these types of like DSNs, whether it be, you know, whether it be not even just talking about file code specifically, but whether it's like, are we for storage or like uh, sure. you know, impossible cloud or these other types of things that are trying to do essentially the same thing that Filecoin is trying to do maybe with, with you know, slightly differently, but like, like how, I mean, I've always kind of seen this as like the, the real obvious sort of like enterprise use case of, of like web three, right? Like this is kind of like the most like readily apparent, like kind of like what will end up being kind of the first like enterprise type use case for web three is this, 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 this concept of a, of a decentralized blockchain powered data storage network, but would love your, would love your reaction to that. Ultimately, in my opinion, right now, depending on what technology you're looking at, right, which DSN you're looking at, you you have to take into account how fast you can move the data in and out, right? So if I look at Filecoin, that's a perfect archival frozen target. And it's ideal for for what it's intended for. Then you have Storage A, which is trying to build that that DSN with with the faster access, right? So you, you dissolve each DSN for its use. But, but ultimately, the one thing that all of them will serve, in my opinion, is the concept of business continuity and disaster recovery. Hmm. What you're seeing today with the DSNs, it's going to make these things a lot more seamless. Today, it's a struggle. Um, as a matter of fact, I have a colleague that lives in, in Tennessee, and as you know, Hurricane Helene came and, and ripped through and did a lot of damage. There's a county there in, in Tennessee, and I, you should get him on your podcast one day to talk about data resiliency and, and some of these issues because he, he's an amazing storyteller, right? His name is Chris Galati. But he, he shared with me that in his county, they, they had a, a pump station that sat on the river. The pump station fed water to the entire county. And what happened was when Helene ripped through it, destroyed the pump station, right? And they had talked for years about building a second station as a as a backup, right? It would have cost, I think, like I think he said it was like twelve million dollars, whatever it was. You know, was it was just some. It was a decent sized number, but not one of those things that made you go, "Oh my god!" Right? So when the pump station went down, they were only able to feed the county water from two water towers where water was stored, and there was only about two days worth of water. They ran out of water. Mm-hmm. Their stopgap was they went down and and put diesel pumps down on the river and started running these diesel pumps. But the diesel pumps have limitations. You don't want to run them 24 by 7 by 365. They have to do filter replacement. There's somebody's they literally have to be manned every hour of the day. So you've you've got all of the staff now that wasn't necessary before. They had to do seal replacements. There's all these like the pumps break a lot more frequently um, in in this this usage model. So instead of spending the 12 million to build the second pump station and make sure you had a re- redundancy plan. You went off and and now you're going to spend maybe 10x when it's all said and done because of all of the the, the emergency measures you've now had to take just to to stay alive and, and get water out to the county. And business operations are going to be the same way. And being able to geographically distribute the data, have a skeleton set up where you could say, hey, this business just took a hit. Look, look what happens when a region in Amazon goes down, right? It's completely right. chaos, right? But if I know my data is on east coast and on the west coast and something happens on the east coast maybe i have an outage maybe a power station goes down maybe a hurricane i don't know it comes through and yeah into shreds well i just spin up my skeleton operations on the west coast i don't feel the pain or maybe i'm on the west coast an earthquake happens i've got my my mirrored set up on the east coast dsns are going to make this all possible and it's going to make it far more seamless than it is today um specifically uh you know, in terms of cost, it's going to be a tremendous, tremendous boon for a lot of the enterprises once they embrace them. Yeah, that's a, that's a great analogy. It's, it's a great way to think about it. Really, is this is like yeah, like you know, you have one power station, then a bam, a hurricane shows up, and then like oh crap, we should have thought about this beforehand. Like it wouldn't have yes. cost that much extra money. I mean, it's, it's to some way, it's maybe in some sense, it's kind of like a penny wise, pound foolish sort of thing where mm-hmm. you try to save money in the short term, but it ends up costing more in the long run. But also, it's just more of you know, maybe you just hadn't fully thought it through, right? Like, like we Correct. don't live in a hurricane, like in, in Tennessee, you don't live in a hurricane zone, right? It's generally not a hurricane <laughs> yeah, zone until right. this year anyway. Uh, so like you just, you know, but you just never know what could happen. Right. right. And, um, 
I mean, I've heard you talk before even about, um, you know, kind of like cyber attack resilience and, and mm -hmm. like, and, 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 and just things of that nature where, or ransomwares and, and these types of things where you're know, like, okay, if all your, if, if everything's stored in one location and it gets like ransomware attacked and you can't access your data, it's like, well, it's, if it's stored on Filecoin, then, you know, I have, I have it stored in four other locations around the world. So it's, it's not like, you know, I don't right. have to, I don't have to send the ransom like overnight or, you know, the ransom payment overnight or whatever, because I, I can still access the data somewhere else. So having this, I think it's like this is the core concept that I think people need to like really want really take away from the idea of Filecoin DSNs is just that it's the resiliency component of it, right? Like you just never know what's going to happen. There's always going to be some kind of uh, threat that might exist that you can't plan for, some sort of black swan type event, sure. right? And having this resiliency angle built in, just like natively to the protocol design, um, yeah, for for what like when you're providing a critical service, like you can't afford to go down, like even you know even Correct. for a moment, right? Correct. So, um, shifting gears here slightly, I would love for you to, uh, as somebody who is who's like pretty heavily involved in Filecoin, now you're you're sort of you're kind of like you know adjacent to Filecoin. You're doing something a bit different, but still like heavily relevant to Filecoin. Absolutely. I wanted. I was hoping you could maybe give us just from your vantage point, like how would you describe the state of the Filecoin ecosystem? right now like if we were to do kind of like a mini you know swath analysis here like strengths weaknesses like what do you think we're like doing really well and like where do you think we need to maybe be pushing a little bit harder from a, from a swap perspective what filecoin really did well in my opinion was getting people excited about becoming a storage provider i mean there were thousands of them right they, they were popping up like left and right and and as an architect we used to, to work with them on, on how to build your business. We had the ESPA program. I thought that was a fantastic, fantastic thing because ESPA really gave you not only the, the technical know-how to participate, but it helped you to build a real core business. It was really focused on things like you know, having the right staff, understanding tax ramifications, and, and building out something that was really like something you could call your own. Um, and I, I think that was what they've always done well is they've brought people together. They, they've always kind of catered to, to those that were interested and gave them mechanisms under which they could participate. And, you know, you had s some spinoffs. You had like, you know, for instance, Saturn, right, where you could just fire up a Saturn node. You could participate at a low level. So I think it's always been a, a great thing the way they fostered participation. It's, it's always been a home run. Now, you don't have as many providers today, and that, that's the nature of the economy, right? You don't have as many providers today as, as back when I was really fully ramped up, working at PL, working for the foundation, but you still have a lot out there. I think right now, with the nucleation and with the way things are going and you're seeing, you, you, you kind of mentioned um, when we were talking earlier, you had, you had like Sirach, Sriracha and, and Akave and there's us and there's there's some of these other options. What you're seeing now is, is response to the demand. And what I mean by that is people need ways to leverage the network easily, smoothly within their workflows. So by build, by us building this, by Akave building their thing, by Staracha building their thing, we're giving end users the ability to, to interact with Filecoin in a way that's native and known to them. And, and that's going to be important. That's going to help with adoption. So that's another thing that I feel is, is headed in the right direction. So like, for instance, the framework that we're building, right? You'll be able to write data over S3. You might even write it to a NAS and, and you want to move it. We're going to, we're going to do that for you. So these things are all important. Where I think things are, are kind of, I don't want to say negative, but because we never had those solutions, or at least not well-rounded solutions, and, and they're coming, they're being built, but without them, it was hard to get the adoption necessary to help Filecoin really take off. Now, it's still a very large network. It is the largest DSN, hands down, by far, there, no question about it, and there are others that have kind of popped up, but Ultimately, until we figure out how to feed the SPs in, in a way that's financially beneficial, it's going to be hard to A, keep them in the network and B, grow that network. But if we're successful, what we're doing now is enabling enterprises to use all of these different vendors, all of these different storage targets, all of these different geographic localities, which were never available to them before. We just have to do it in a diligent sense. And, and if I really look at it, as these tools grow, the, the biggest problem really is we didn't grow them fast enough. 
and and that, that's part of the the reason that I'm working with with uh, a lot of these guys to to build these types of solutions because I feel like this is the future. S3 was a future at one point. People weren't ready to adopt, so they they built gateways. They built the Avers, the Nasunis, the et cetera of the world. And then you started seeing solutions say, oh, now we can natively speak S3, whether it was backup utilities like Commvault and Veeam and you know Rubrik or whatever. Then people started to, to really adopt that paradigm. And DSNs are going to be no different. It's going to be a matter of, of saying, we can get your data there for you. And when you're ready, just start using the network as it's, it's intended. And, and those things will come. But... Had we, in my opinion, focused on this a little earlier, I, I think we would be at a different network state. But the benefit to that is that this breeds opportunity. It gives us an opportunity to go out and build these businesses and make these paradigm shifts happen and do it on our terms. I, I think everybody who is involved in this, as you know, Stefan has a long background in storage. I mean, he hired me at my my first startup at, at Ampladata. And he's been doing this a long time. So have I. Um, I've got the the grade to prove it. But <laughs> all things that that are are really important to to keep this network going. And and we firmly believe the solution that we're building. And we're, like I said, we're calling it the bridge. We're building the Swift for data. So if if you want to be able to move data work within the confines of regulations, and th- there's going to be a lot of intelligence on the platform as we build it. And, and these are all very big focal points for us. And we feel like by building this, we're making DSNs extremely relevant and powerful. And that is our goal, is to make these DSNs so relevant and powerful that you can't not look at them. You can't not consider them. You can't not leverage them. Because at the end of the day, if you don't, your competitors will, will move past you. And that's what happened with S3. Once people figured out the inherent value of S3, they started going, hey, man, uh, you know, Enterprise A is doing this. Maybe I should. And then Enterprise B says, man, A is doing this because Z did this. Let's let's go off and do this. And before you know it, it's like that rolling effect downhill. And if you look at the statistics, by next year, they believe there will be 100 zettabytes in the public cloud from, from primarily wow. enterprise. But they believe the same amount will exist on-prem. Tremendous opportunity for integration frameworks. Wow. So this is where we're, we're really living. And we're, we're watching this data paradigm shift. And what's going to happen is as time moves on, you're going to see that uh, on-prem data start moving off, and, and part of that will be delivering solutions that allow you to do it expeditiously, to, to leverage the speed and the performance and the behavior, because there's still a lot of workloads that need to be run on-prem just because of, of performance issues, right? NAS still exists for a reason. Once we get to a point where we can satisfy a lot of those needs, it becomes a home run. Well, that's super interesting, and and I think that's what that's what excites me the most about the network as well right now is is just like the emergence of these these L two networks and these 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 yes. uh, layers that you guys are building, and like in the you know the Akaves and the Bays and Staraches, et cetera, where it's it's really trying to you know take that core problem that you had mentioned earlier, which is like getting data onto the net. I mean, it's, it's the it's the kind of the chicken and egg prog- problem that every uh, you know D pin network faces, yes. right? If we're, if we're to call we're call Filecoin D pin here, but like. You know, it's like, yeah, you've got to have the supply, you've got to have the demand, you've got to kind of like weigh these two things, you've got to actually have the rails to be able to get the demand, you know, that data onto the network. Yep. Um, you know, we, you got to have the incentives programs to be able to like bootstrap the demand when maybe organically there wasn't much to begin with. Yep. Um, and I think we kind of hit this point where like, you know, Phil Plus worked pretty well as an incentive mechanism to get data on the network, but then it's like, well, we got to be able to actually get the data onto the network, right? <laughs> like, yes. You know, <laughs> so uh, you know, so we ended up having some you know, some issues with backlogs and things, which is where you know yourself and others were were working hard to 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 to, to resolve. Yeah, uh, but we, having we, these, we actually feel we have a very interesting solution for that. So, so one of the things that was always discussed was the the concept of retrieval on Filecoin, and and I'm. Um, Pardon me for interrupting, but I, I thought this Go was ahead. a relevant point. Um, when you when you store data on a DSN, it's immutable; it, it, it can't be changed. But the one thing that was kind of eh, was was the retrievability factor. So one of the things that we are planning on doing is, is having a verification model where you can have third parties essentially say, "Yeah, I can retrieve your data from Filecoin; it looks good." And and upon that, there's a financial incentive for the verifiers to do that. And the cool part is a portion of that goes to the SP that gets verified. So we're incentivizing retrievals. Mm. That was one of the holes that was rampantly discussed uh, on Filecoin was incentivized retrievals. How do we do that? And it was it was kicked around a lot. I know it, there are a lot of people far smarter than I that have, have debated over this topic. Um, but we feel like in order to make these things 
powerful, useful, and, and really encourage these SPs to participate openly in that manner, incentivizing retrievals is a big deal. The other thing that will fall out of this is the adjacent compute. The one thing that I think will make DSNs even more relevant is as these storage providers start providing these storage services, their ability to also deliver compute adjacent to the storage so that you have the compute over data becomes a very powerful story. Specifically, when you get into the, the disaster recovery and the business continuity models and having essentially skeleton failover. So you may have a, a bulk of your compute in New York City and it's you know thousands of cores, terabytes of RAM. And then in California, you have a skeleton where it's maybe one third the size, but you can still continue critical business operations. That's all part of your, your BCDR failover plans. And not enough enterprises are doing this. DSNs are going to enable this in, in a very unique way. And I feel like we have to lean into that. No, that's super interesting. Um, that's a super interesting like point to even just leave this this conversation and this conversation on is that like this is something that is going to be in your view is going to be like this is just going to become a standard part of everyone's business continuity plan, right? Like this is how you just prep for a disaster. You have to have if you don't have a if you haven't thought about how you could utilize utilize the DSN in kind of your your worst case scenario disaster planning, then it's like you're just not being responsible basically, right? Um, so I think that's a super interesting like kind of uh, you know point to leave this on, and. Um, uh, but Shrek, I want to want to thank you for your time here. For thanks for coming on the show. Uh, you're you're like a world of knowledge on this stuff, so it's really really fun being able to talk to you. And would love to have you back on at some point once you guys are uh, kind of out of stealth mode and, and up and running uh, formally. Um, but I'll I'll turn it back to you for any final words, final thoughts, and then how can folks find you if they want to get in touch? Oh, uh, that's easy. I'm I'm readily available on LinkedIn. You can find me. I'm I'm Bill Schreckenstein. Not hard to find. The last name is a little bit of a pain to spell, but we'll we'll, we'll put it out there. So that's um, a lot of C's. <laughs> right there's, there's more c's two. than you'd think there yeah well it's it's like there there's two there's silence too many silent c's in the name is uh <laughs> honestly you know it's funny once you once you get used to spelling it it becomes rather phonetic right um originally my, my family when they came over from germany this is a long long time ago we're, we're actually directly descended from nietzsche and that spelling is even oh. worse in my opinion oh, yeah. so <laughs> it, it's kind of wild right but yeah you, you can find me on on linkedin i'm very active uh, i'm active on twitter my handle is dr shrek 77 um very easy to find there and uh, essentially you'll, you'll see some musings about storage uh the cubic network which is is a project that i'm really enjoying right now i think it has tremendous value and Honestly, I hope someday we actually integrate with them because the ability to process smart contracts in near real time is, is, is amazing, right? So there's a lot of things going on that, that I think in this space, and, and you're, you kind of saw the, the boom to, to Bitcoin and a few others last night, uh, driven by, I, I feel like, the election results, right? So you're, you're seeing a lot of, of I want to say, momentum in this space. And I would love to see businesses out there really embracing it and, and taking advantage of that momentum. And I, I think it's there for folks. So if anybody has any questions, you, j DM me. Just just drop me a message. I'm, I'm happy to chat. But I, I think right now it's a very exciting time. This, this paradigm shift that you're seeing I think will be openly embraced. And I do think it, there's tremendous opportunities for folks out there looking for the next big thing. To come in and, and do what I'm doing, do what Stefan is doing, do what the Banyans and the Starachas of the world are doing, where we're going to start a business on this principle and we're going to make this thing practical. And, and in doing so, I think creates a lot of opportunities for people to not only build a business, but also at the same time help get the, the adoption necessary for this technology to become this new big thing. And then that's really ultimately all we could really hope for, because I do feel like if you look at the world of, let's say, cyber insurance, right, one of the, you get policy discounts if you can maintain an immutable copy on a disaggregated network, right, have near gap. DSNs deliver that in a hybrid environment, right? I can right. write Filecoin. If I have my data on-prem, I can write a copy to Filecoin, completely different protocol, completely segregated, immutable. There's my air gap copy. I'm done. And it's going to check a lot of boxes for compliance and policy in the future. It will drive policy and compliance, in my opinion, in the future. It's a tremendous opportunity. And I think the more people that seize it, the more viable this becomes as a real solution. Well, that's a great point to end on. Uh, really interesting, really interesting food for thought there. And um, yeah, I couldn't agree more that this, it just seems like this is going to become like, you know, a boilerplate compliance thing at, at the end of the day, right? That this is just something yeah. you're expected to do if you're, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if, if you're, if you're working in data protection for a large enterprise, like, or, you know, this is just something you're supposed to be doing, right? Um, right. You're implementing these types of networks. So 
Um, well, Shrek, really appreciate your time. We'll have to have you back on soon to, to talk more about what you're working on uh, with your with your startup. And love that. thanks everyone for, for watching and we will see you next time on DWeb Decoded. Bye everybody.